Good. It's lovely to be here uh, and to be backed by such wonderful music. Um, I'm going to look at love, and I'm sure you haven't explored the deepest recesses of love until you finally understand every word the beloved isn't saying. In love as in poetry, the unspoken is what it's all about for me. And being in the gallery reminds me um, that true love is cubist. Uh, it looks at the beloved from every possible angle and still loves. And maybe it's modernist too, because it's tolerant of the fractures, the inconsistencies, and even the wrinkles that we have. So a question I've been asking myself of poetry is, how might language imitate and enact love as experienced rather than simply talk about it? Can poetry accommodate that fracturedness or the strangenesses of love? And a partial answer to that question would be a short run of three poems I'm going to share with you from my tulips. And these particular pieces all touch on absence. Um, either that yearning, sometimes most acutely felt when the beloved is lying right there next to you, lost in sleep, or that absence a house takes on when the lover has just vacated it, leaving behind a trace presence, um, almost homeopathically. There's one word I should explain, hain. It's an old word for enclosure, to enclose with a fence or hedge or to save. A single drop can musk a home. Roll up stairwells and nudge through jackets, sad with draping, then shoulder past attic flap till in rafter, skirting and weight-bearing wall, the whole house slows to it, swells to that one substance whose clock tick is imperfection, and under its surface an ave kneels, sucking my life thread to a point, to thread endless needles of silence, and I, of a sudden, am very of. As if these rooms had matched me inner to outer, as though world and I had made time to sit together, each waiting for other to speak. What happens between breaths when you sleep is neither you nor you sleeping, but something ships do, darker and deeper than night they find themselves in, straining at the turn, the balanced instant when prow hangs and world could go either with neck swell or under as I ballast you unseen and hold this breath. One black curl against your nape as you face into sleep and I fall to single rhythmed breath expressed there whose hairline shift hanes against worry, some thread here within. Making love plain for one who takes love in, in small degree, as that hook of dark against your neck, foxed and soft with living, takes a bearing into dream. And old fish, I let it reel me after. For I, tulips, one of my guiding lights, and perhaps with tulips in mind, I should say fertilizer, was Black Mountain, the Black Mountain School in America. And Charles Olson, a chieftain of that school, led me to the idea that a poem might not be trying to tell you about experience, but attempting to catch it mid-stride. As I put it myself, poetry is fishing rather than taxidermy. Um, there's my own going, ongoing sense, too, that poetry can be deeply innovative, highly experimental, and yet remain direct and accessible. 
at least through its patterning of sound, its music. It must always hold on to music. And why should poems be linear? Who said they're equations? In this next poem, um, I simultaneously explore love, ecology, and outer space. Why not? And the poem leans on the idea now discredited, um, which I'm sad about, that the human embryo in the womb rehearses all our earlier stages of evolution. And even if it's untrue, it's a beautifully potent idea that we are or have been all things. Everyone begins as fish and ends so, spiralling after egg that other half of our chains and set in gills in gristled knot that buds legs as tadpoles do and blow whole ears halfway down the back and low set eye alien as featherless chick. Ah, we have peered into that shared ovum whose blasto flesh runs its gauntlet of fowl and fish, so fused at the tail, nothing can be told apart. Is this why when I am late, I find in upstairs dark, you on placenta duvet, and hunched round self as wombed ones are, as though I had just returned from all eternity to catch you naked, out, sleepwalking, space, without even navel-twisted, purpled rope to hold you. I'm going to take a risk with this one. It's very much at the impressionistic end of the eye tulip scale. Perhaps the best way to receive it is to let it wash over you. Um, it's a verbal parallel, perhaps, to a Pollock painting. Um, and it, it centers on this African idea I came across, that there are various kinds of love you can describe in terms of pillows. How many pillows? Who has the pillows? And where the pillows are? But along the way, it became not just pillow talk from Africa, but a weird trawl of the entire history of love and knowledge as told through the body. So nothing ambitious. And while Larkin, or someone like Mark Larkin, might have had us pickle this experience, I've gone with Black Mountain and Olsen and tried to enact it. So this is language not merely observing, but participating. And remembering with that other great American, Wallace Stevens, that all poetry is experimental poetry. Love sends itself flowers and mails its single-stemmed blood down the spine or telegraph, or petal and thorn, and never signs the card. Oh, I stand at the delivery ajar and wondrous at my syncopating lobes as rhythm love swells down there to the one old tune. Work it out, head puffs, work it out that pencil bite in maths of trouser and gusset forged in the belly furnace, those matching sets of differentials yielding smaller version selves. Such noble illusions I have borne through changeling vein, a zillion, Sumerian, Cretan, Egyptian, Navajo, Greco-Roman, all the one difference through China, Belgium, to Mesoamerica, I crossed burning and spurned bridges and crossed myself pons pubis to pons cranium, spanned with that smile I cannot put on. For she who gave speech in chocolate-sized pieces gave speech me, gave speech you, O Prometheus. Bind me in my red room on this red mountain. Bind me to tell through the liver each form of love. For there is married love, and married love with a pillow, and married love with pillows for head and foot, and married love with the pillow between, and the woman with six children and pillow, and the man who has come to woman who has a husband to ask for a pillow, and three men who seek the same married pillow. These are the forms 
whose words have quarrelled with pillows between. For illusion excels as I say its three words over and out, with a voice print computers can register grimly. O oh, love, you have sent a peas in flowers, and that delivery tries every address down my spine. But I grow closer in calculating who sends. I'm singling you out by elimination. Can nibble your edges, O oh love, earlobe viced between my lips, those fluttering hands clamped at my brow, your bracing breath upon my instruments. I have you. A hatchling in my palm, I have you as you were when you began, and soon means to determine your flight, to release when you suit me. For I would go naked, though not through Eden, though not in the head, and so will take you while you are going, take you while you are going fast, take you three in a bed with knowing, but then what one dressed, what, what thrust in luck. I can still peel you back to climb in beside myself, to slide, yes, slide in to love, full clothed. I'm going to read briefly from the two other Enitharman books, Flowers of Sulphur and Heavy Water, a poem for Chernobyl. And this first poem from Flowers of Sulphur is about the Italian homeland. Um, it's a love poem between male relatives, which is still not a common subject, I think, even now in poetry. And my grandfather, my nonno, was a man of intense ritual. He had his own spiritual understanding of land, sky, self, but he could be incredibly cryptic. Once he leant across the table and whispered to me, you know, Mario, the blind man is never far from the gravy. <laughs> I learned to nod. But one hot afternoon in Italy, he performed a simple, touching ritual that's still very much with me. We might mourn the loss of biodiversity, quite rightly, but we're also losing ways of being in the world, such as his. There's another word in this one, glyph. Um, a hieroglyphic character, as you'll know, but also in architecture, a carved ornamental groove or channel. Wanted to say something about grandfather. How one white afternoon under the vines, he stripped a cucumber with his penknife and offered. But my lecturer told us, the edifice of consciousness needs a scaffold of knowledge. Though my grandfather said nothing, just walked ahead beneath a bladder rack of figs, whose rinsed greenish light made me gasp for brilliance. Then to a cove of starfish leaves, where he speared some underwater spiculed thing, a creature that had, it seemed, never proper sun, and paired it, alive, to near greenness in hands cured to leather by cigar smoke, the earth. Yet in me still, that bloodless child winks at the one full-lit dapple finding my face, at his need to shave a rind, strip by translucent strip, holding its last wet film up to light. That's it. Grandfather making light of the knowing in his eyes, how he saw in me days broad as a noon-lit road, where I see only a narrow past. That he held out this, his grandfather's seed, nerving that flesh, running its length like a glyph through rock. Each time I slice watercolour stars or strike a salad strange mint of coins. I've never witnessed a more dogged love than my mother's for my father. 
She was constantly by his deathbed, but in a very brief absence, missed his last words. What were they, you ask? What? What did he say exactly? Truth is, I couldn't hear. Though I leaned so far, the blood in his breath made me gag. I'll settle for that silver beach, 40 years back, his gift of gritty ice cream, hand like a socket to the ball of my shoulder. The way he leaned so close, I thought his breathing the sea. Good boy, he told me. The last excerpts I'm going to read you are from my first book with Enith Arman, Heavy Water, a poem for Chernobyl. This book is based on first-hand accounts of what happened in those days following the explosion near Pripyat in April 1986. And what struck me reading those accounts is the way we usually associate Chernobyl with unbearable suffering, great tragedy, and of course it has that. But in fact, all the human emotions there, including love, were amplified, it seemed, by that situation. I'm not going to say anything in explanation of these pieces or between them or at the end. So let me thank you now, particularly Linda and the Poets and Players group for setting this up, the gallery for this astonishing space and this wonderful acoustic, and all of you for coming. Uh, I appreciate your wonderful attention very much. Heavy water. Ten padlocks. One for his lips, for saying I'll go. One for that gate his father wrought, through which I had to watch him walk. One for the dick of a boss who laid him off with a mechanical, I didn't send you there. One to keep eyes dry that now will have no father in. One for our wedding mattress that will stoke no other man. One for that one thought the hospital burned deep in his brain to make him swear alone with his glass. One for the stench we opened whenever we turned him. One for his bones. When I am gone, a grandson under cover of dark will bolt them to mine. One for this black box of my heart. Ten, make me ten padlocks, with each key different. The last I send to you who do not see, to keep them out when they come for you. Every day I found a new man, Ludmila Ignatenko. Do not kiss him, they said, starting back as though he were an animal in its cot, cocking its head to listen, but understanding nothing. Do you understand? Are you pregnant? No. And find him milk, three litres a day. I poured that whiteness into him, felt I was feeding a goose its own feathers. He retched and cursed, the thin dribble each side of his mouth worse than a child. Each time you hold his hand is a year off your life. Can you hear us? His bones are more active than the core. Understand, that is no longer your husband. I boiled chickens until the bones sagged, fresh, handfuls of parsley chopped so fine it would melt between finger and thumb, pot barley, apples from Michurinsk, they told me, pared and pulped, everything minced and sieved, every trace of rind or pip removed, no husk, shell or pod, and all of it 
spewed back down his chest as though he could not take a single particle more. The black of his forearms and thighs cracked like pastry. His eyelids swelled so tight with water he could not see for skin. The lightest sheet peeled away fat as flypaper. The slightest edge of thumbnail was to him more vicious than any cutthroat. If I moved his head, it streaked hair down the pillow as though he were a used match. If I pressed a knuckle in, our wedding flesh. The indent remained like hot grey putty. He coughed bile, acid, froth and lung, shreds of stomach and liver, and still he stayed. Refused that first, that last step onto the Jacob ladder. Those reptile eggs of eyelids turned always towards me until I said, Go, I love you, but go. Up to that moment, I still believed I would save him. Milk, soup, kisses, as if he could digest the touch of my lips, feel my making of broth in his dissolving heart chambers. When his breath shut, when he began to call, then I called for family. It was almost a miracle, the doctors said. Four times the fatal dose, and he nearly turned round. I felt myself the wrong side of a door. A partition thin as plywood, thinner, as though you could hear everything that was going on inside. His mother hugged me. The brothers kissed me. Now we are your brothers. Have you ever been the wrong side of that door? Knowing all you needed was the key and you could walk straight in. That's how it was. We were that close. There was life, a life before. A girl of 16, a rigor of 24, meeting for cakes and nothing else. A girl who made herself late just to see what a handsome man waited for her. After work, beneath the clock, close by the post office, Volodarsky Street. And ah, that night, they shared champagne and madelines under stars in Gorky Park until their hands gravitated and both dared whisper, yes, yes, they said, then touched lips as though it were some law of physics. One year together before finally they kissed and nothing more. Who would believe it? Who would change a breath of it? even if a voice of doom boomed in from the planets.